That's one of my favorite uh, hymns. Welcome to uh, Trinity United Church Collingwood. This is the service for the 10th Sunday after Pentecost, the date August 1, 2021. Welcome to Trinity United Church. We strive to be a safe community for all, regardless of race, creed, age, cultural background, religious affiliation, sexual orientation, or gender identification. Here we are all children and invited guests of God. We acknowledge that for many thousands of years, the indigenous people of Turtle Island walked on this land too. We are thankful to share in the special spirit of this place, rich in the energy of Mother Earth and the love of all creation. Amen. I'll light our Christ candle and we'll sing holy, holy, holy. We welcome uh, Patty back to the uh, singing and reading role this week again. It's uh, so delightful to have her and uh, she and Ray have been taking turns in these uh, tapings as well as the Sunday services. We thanks to our crew up on top that are uh, here dutifully taping and uh, video. It seems like we're getting uh, better at it as we go, that's for sure. And uh, at this point in our story, um, so we're taping this beforehand. At this point in the story, we've started to learn about the deaths of many of the indigenous children who are at uh, residential schools. And I imagine by the time that you uh, see this service in August, there will be more revelation. And it's a story that's uh, extremely painful for us to bear, but bear it we must um, and un unearth the truth uh, we must. So I hope our prayers and our actions uh, are congruent with each other in the time that we find ourselves now and the time to come. As we uh, walk through uh, the summer months, um, we're doing summer poetry. And this is a poet um, by the name of Leslie Choice. Um, he is from the uh, East Coast. And I, I believe he's a professor um, or was a professor at one of the universities in the east and it's called Medicine Walk and uh, when I read it I thought I know the restoration and many people tell me they go to the woods to forest bathe to be part um, and close to nature and uh, this is about um, exactly that it's called Medicine Walk when you believe you are beyond repair let go when you cannot be saved by all your friends when you cannot be saved by yourself Forget who you are and deliver what is left of yourself to that place you've been to before, but did not understand its worth. Use whatever means to get close, but then you must walk the rest of the way. And if you cannot walk, then crawl. It's your only hope. The word sacred could scare you off to be silent. Be there. And do not ask how boulders covered with star moss, wind-bowed apple branches, or the song of a small chanting brook can salvage you, but it will. Some very important people I know have been saved by the song of the smallest birds, others redeemed by the smell of leaves rotting in a forest. Remember this. Amen. The next hymn we're going to sing is 371, Open My Eyes That I May See.
settings for that, Paul, in your registry. Oh, this part of the organ, which is the lower keyboard, and the the one the sound that bites is called the cymbal. So without that, gives that texture to the sound. You probably couldn't hear everything Paul said or anything Paul said, but he. He was talking about using the uh, registry or the uh, settings to the right of the organ, and uh, that gives that sound that sounds uh, almost carnival-like. That's uh, what he, what are the, <laughs> the big machines at the, at the uh, circus? You know, the, not the harp, of course. The, the Wurlitzer? The yeah, Wurlitzer. well, the Wurlitzer, but it's uh, first word. Anyway, you know what I mean. So I, today I'm talking about Mary and uh, Mariology. It's an interesting, in, if you've been in any of the Catholic churches uh, in town or almost any of the Roman Catholic churches, there's usually a uh, statue of Mary. And uh, Mary is usually depicted in a blue dress, uh, can be red dress, roses as well. And uh, we say that the figure with the Christ child is the Madonna. So it's the Virgin Mary with the Christ child. And uh, she is a in the uh, Catholic Church has a singularity, singular dignity um, above all saints. So she is the highest saint in the church. And uh, she was conceived as the doctrine, the Catholic uh, doctrine goes. Um, she was conceived in uh, immaculate conception as was Jesus. And uh, she's the mother of God. Um, and she is said to be, these are, are four of the uh, main tenets of the Mariology within the Catholic Catholic Church. She is a perpetual virgin and uh, um, assumption she was also taken up in bodily form to heaven according to the uh, legends around Mary. It's a uh, there's a maximalism. Marian is everything is attributed to Mary in some traditions and a minimal minimalism. Um, nothing is attributed or very little is attributed to Mary even within the same uh, the same denominations so some denominations uh, hold Mary in very high esteem and some congregations within the same with same the tradition hold Mary in a different esteem um, than the rest it's a uh, it's almost separate from Christianity so there is a uh, there's almost a uh, and I say this I don't know what else to say except a doctrine of Mary it's not a cult of Mary, but it, it can almost become um, a figure that is as important in the, someone's faith as uh, Christian um, figures themselves, so the Godhead, and then Mary is also included, um, it's almost a uh, quadrilateral, uh, if you will, in uh, some traditions. Mary is seen as a redeemer, as the intercessor, and the uh, person to whom people can receive grace. So when we start the prayer, when people in some traditions, uh, Mother Mary full of grace. Um, it's the way people start to pray. And people pray uh, in some traditions directly to Mary. So it isn't Jesus or God. They actually pray directly to Mary. Um, in Eastern Christianity and in the early church, she was said to be Theotokos, which means the bearer of God. But uh, over, as the centuries went by, and as you've probably heard me talk about many times, the church debates uh, ranged as we worked out our own Christologies and uh, theologies. And uh, some people settled on uh, she was Christotokos, so bearer of Christ, but not God. Because if she bore God, then the problem was, where was God before she bore God? And uh, so it's working out some of those theologies and Christologies. She uh, is the heart of the church, many churches, and the female form of God for some people who prefer to pray to a uh, female image, uh, a deity um, in their theology as uh, very close, if not equivalent to God. In the uh, time of Reformation, so the reformers rejected Mary um, as important in the, uh, in the Trinitarian formula and uh, she was not to be included in the Godhead. And they even said, and it was called Mary idolatry. Um, they said that Mary had become an idol in the uh, Catholic Church. And so the reformers, uh, many of the reformers, rejected the image of Mary um, right out of hand. So she was not to be venerated in any way. And that is, think, fairly true 
uh, throughout much of the Protestant tradition, even the Protestant tradition that we've inherited ourselves. Um, interesting, and she's the only woman mentioned in the Quran by name. So the Quran names her as the important uh, virgin uh, who gave birth to the prophet Jesus, peace be upon him. Um, and so she's, she's mentioned in the Quran as well. So outside of our own tradition, Mary holds a very important place. And uh, one of the uh, things I was reading about Mary is um, gave birth to Jesus, who is called the new Adam, but she is also seen as the next Eve. But in the story of Mary, as uh, uh, in the time of Immaculate, uh, as the, the angel um, overshadowed her and she became pregnant uh, with Christ in that moment of in Immaculate Conception, um, she said yes to God, and uh, Eve, according to the story, had by her actions said no to God. So Mary said yes, and Eve said no. And so she bore Jesus, um, the new Adam. It's uh, interesting in, uh, you can't see this, I'm sure, in our cameras, but when you come back in the church, uh, in our church we have one stained glass, I think only one, in which Mary is depicted and so she, it's the uh, nativity scene. So Mary is in the window, uh, in the window picture, and with her is Joseph and the, uh, um, the shepherd. And uh, if you notice in the window, um, Mary does not have a halo over her head. So true to form in the Protestant tradition, uh, she is seen as a very human figure who gave birth to Jesus. On her knee sits Jesus with a halo over his head. So in, in, in consistent with our own Protestant tradition, Mary is seen as very key to the story, but not seen as a saint. And if you look at our other pictures, uh, some of the apostles on the beach, so the other stained glass windows, they, all, they do have halos over their, their head. And uh, so in some ways, our art says that the apostles, the first disciples, held a more important place in the story than, uh, than Mary did. So it's very interesting, uh, um, and that's one of the reasons when you go to a Catholic church, the Mary is so highly featured, and when you come to a Protestant church, uh, most Protestant churches bear little, if any, reference to her in our story. We certainly sing about her at Christmas, but beyond that, um, she doesn't hold much of a place in our Christology or theologies. And that is something about the Mariology of the church. The next time we're going to sing, uh, and this is one is from uh, More Voices, Deep in Our Hearts.
morning. Our first reading is Ephesians 4, 1 to 16. I, therefore, the prisoner in the Lord, beg you to lead a life worthy of the calling to which you have been called, with all humility and gentleness, with patience, bearing with one, bearing with one another in love, making every effort to maintain the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. There is one body and one Spirit, just as you were called to the one hope of your calling, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God, and one Father of all, who is above all and through all and in all. But each of us was given grace according to the measure of Christ's gift. Therefore, it is said, when he ascended on high, he made captivity itself a captive. He gave gifts to his people. When it says he ascended, what does it mean? But the head also descended into the lower parts of the earth. He who descended is the same one who ascended far above the heavens so that he might fill all things. The gifts he gave were that some would be apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, some pastors, and teachers, to equip the saints for the work of the ministry, for building up the body of Christ, until all of us come to the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God, to maturity, to the measure of the full stature of Christ. We must no longer be children tossed to and fro and blown about by every wind of doctrine, by people's trickery, by their craftiness and deceitful scheming. But speaking the truth in love, we must grow up in every way into him who is the head, into Christ, from whom the whole body, joined and knit together by every ligament with which it is equipped, and as each part is working properly, promotes the body's growth in building itself up in love. Our second reading is Second Samuel. As soon as I find it. Eleven, twenty-six, and we'll carry on into twelve, and we'll stop at thir verse thirteen. <clears throat> When the wife of Uriah heard that her husband was dead, she made lamentations for him. When the morning was over, David sent and brought her to his house, and she became his wife and bore him a son. But the thing that David had done displeased the Lord, and the Lord sent Nathan to David. He came to him and said to him, There were two men in a certain city, the one rich and the other poor. The rich man had very many flocks and herds, but the poor man had nothing but one little ewe lamb, which he had bought. He brought it up, and it grew up with him and his children. It used to eat of his meager fare and drink from his cup and lie down, down in his bosom, and it was like a daughter to him. Now there came a traveler to the rich man, and he was loath to take up his own flock or herd to prepare for the wayfarer, who had come to him, but he took the poor man's lamb and prepared that for the guest who had come to him. Then David's anger was greatly kindled against that man. He said to Nathan, as the Lord lives, the man who has done this deserves to die. He shall restore the lamb fourfold because he did this thing and because he had no piety. Nathan said to David, you are the man. Thus says the Lord, the God of Israel, I anoint you king over Israel, and I rescued fruit from the hand of Saul. I gave you your master's house and your master's wives into your bosom, and gave you the house of Israel and of Judea. And if that had been too little, I would have added as much more. Why have you despised the word of the Lord to do what is evil in his sight? You have struck down Uriah the Hittle the Hittite, with the sword, and have taken his wife to be your wife, and have killed him with the sword of the Ammonites. Now, therefore, the sword shall never depart from your house, for you have despised me, and have taken the wife of Uriah the Hittite to your, be your wife. 
Thus, says the Lord, I will raise up trouble against you from within your own house, and I will take your wives before your eyes and give them to your neighbor, and he shall lie with your wives in the sight of this very sun. For you did it secretly, but I will do this thing before all Israel and before the sun. David said to Nathan, I have sinned against the Lord. Nathan said to David, Now the Lord has put away your sin, you shall not die. I get caught up in the story. Let's do it in prayer. God, help us truly open our ears and our eyes to your truth as it reveals who we are and whose we are. Help us never let go of the faith you offer and the path you ask us to tread is always towards your truth in the name of Christ. As costly as it may be, help us find our way. Amen. I think uh, there's no more loaded sentence when someone says to you, uh, I hope you don't mind me saying this, or uh, um, they say to you, uh, <clears throat> when you ask them a question, do you really want the truth? Uh, and the answer is uh, almost universally no. I mean, if, when a friend is about to give you the truth, it's usually going to sting pretty deeply. Our enemies uh, use the truth against us. They, they are, have no hesitation in saying who we are. And, uh, but they are almost by uh, way of, of that accusation become our enemies. Uh, we don't want to hear that. The truth, even the truth uh, about ourselves is something we avoid. And uh, when we come to the story of David and uh, Bathsheba, and this is the next part of the story, um, we encounter a, a story which is rich and uh, important for us to hear and read. Um, as we know, David was an exceptional uh, leader, an exceptional king. He, in some ways, fell in love with his own myth. Uh, he was, we were told earlier in scripture, he was uh, of fine looks with uh, ruddy cheeks, and he was uh, a stunner of a looker. And uh, he had a, a heart of a lion and took on the, uh, the giant Goliath when no one else would, and he slew the giant. And then, in a way, he also took on Saul, the king, and as we know in the stories, David was uh, the one that replaced Saul as the preferred king of God. And so David is uh, a man of exceptional gifts, and in some ways, when we reach this point in the story, has fallen in love with his own exceptionality. Exceptional um, leaders, and I was going to say exceptional men, and often it is exceptional men, um, think they have a... Uh, a slightly higher bar for morals because they are they're so great that surely that which applies to the uh, everyday person can't apply to them. Um, when I look back in our own recent history and you look at the story of uh, the lowly intern Monica Lewinsky as compared to the, uh, the great leader Bill Clinton, um, it's the same dynamic at work. And in the story that we know of David, Nathan comes and tells him a story. He sits down and uh, starts to tell him the parable of the uh, rich man with all the sheep and the poor man with only one sheep. And it's the story about the ruination in his parable about the rich man taking from the poor man all he had and ruining his life and future. David is uh, <clears throat> rightfully enraged that this could be going on within his own kingdom and said, who is that man? He shall pay fourfold back and he deserves to die. And the trap springs shut on David when Nathan says, you are that man. We, the reader, knew that all along. We knew this, where this was leading. We'd seen as we uh, are watchers of the play, the fourth wall, um, we are the audience watching the uh, play unfold. We knew about David coming back from battle. We knew about Bathsheba on the roof. We knew about David laying with her. We knew about the note coming back uh, to David saying she was pregnant. We knew about David's plot to kill Uriah. 
to first of all implicate him being the father of the child that was fathered, um, that he fathered with Bathsheba. We knew all that. The story is something we know. And as it is with our own stories, it just gets worse and worse and worse. The cover-up gets more tragic. The more he tries to cover up, the less he can sleep and the worse it gets. And then we come to this point in the story and the story is told back to David and Nathan says, you are that man. And the rest of us sit forward and say, now David is going to get it. And as the words of scripture tell us, there will be punch punishment and consequences for his actions. But I think one of the most important aspects of this story is that in that moment of revelation, David does not avoid the condemnation. He doesn't say, well, I can't say anything before it because it's before the courts, and I can't say anything because, uh, uh, well, it's a, a question of, uh, of scientific uh, uh, research. One paper says this, another paper says that. I can't say anything because it wasn't really my fault. I can't say anything because, well, you know about Bathsheba and how she dresses, and why was she bathing on the roof? What he does is he says fully, I sinned before God. Even though he has just heard how he's going to suffer in future, he doesn't avoid his guilt. And I think that this, at this point in the story, the second spring shut, the second trap springs shut, and the fourth wall is broken, and we realize that the parable is as much about great people falling from grace as it is about accepting our own guilt. This is something I think that we don't do, none of us do very well. We avoid at all cost the parable, the pointed end of the parables that tell us who we are in our lives. The parables, of course, are multifaceted stories and they're told in rabbinic uh, fashion, and they, uh, they're called the Trojan horse of uh, stories. We let them in our own gates because we think we understand what they are, and then they open, and they spring open with, uh, and it's sometimes even hostile meaning to our inner defenses. They dissemble in front of us, and suddenly we realize, as David did, that we are that man or that woman in the story. It's uh, um, the parable, if you... Uh, Look at parables and think you know what they're about and extract only one meaning from them. And the point of the parable is uh, that there is no point to the parable. Every time we read the parables, um, every time we read the stories, we can understand them in slightly different ways because we are not the same person that read it the last time. As the old saying goes, you can't step into the same river twice. Neither can you step into the same parable twice. Everything's changed. Last time we heard it, we were different. It was different. The reader was different. The hearer was different. The listener was different. And there's a different meaning in, uh, in, in possibility every time we do hear the parable. It's interesting uh, with jokes. Uh, you can only tell a joke once. You start to tell a joke, and the people, I've already heard it. Because there's only one punchline. Even though the, uh, the joke may be quite, uh, quite elaborate in the telling, there's only one punchline, so I've heard it. When we hear a parable, when we listen to a story, the fairy tales, the myths we have, the parables, they are, there's an excess of meaning in every time and every one that we hear. When we hear the parable of the story of the Good Samaritan, sometimes we hear it and we say, yeah, that's who I am, I'd give an arm and a leg to help that man. The next time we hear it, we say we feel like we're the one mugged by life and laying in the ditch. The next time we hear it, we may say, well, we're of the good religious practice, and we rush by on the other side of the street so we don't have to get involved. Every time we hear the stories, it can tell us something different about ourselves, and the trap that springs shut in this one is the acceptance of guilt is the beginning of healing. Repentance starts, and in every 12-step program, repentance starts with honesty, not brutal honesty, with honesty about what we've done and who we are. And then, and only then, 
is healing possible and a way forward is possible. As I preach today, and uh, as I said at the beginning, <clears throat> we're, we are earlier in the story of the Kamloops uh, discovery, and we are at a moment uh, um, when, when I heard, and I was reading this parable, and I heard the news break, I thought that's precisely what the story is telling us. You are those people. You participated in a way you may not think you're fully implicated, but you are certainly part of the story. You are part of the possibility of the healing that's ahead. It's interesting because the, uh, um, when we say once upon a time, it's usually followed by a long time ago or a place far away. But when we say once upon a time in the style of parables, once upon a time is once upon our time. Once upon a time, this is happening. This is happening now. This is happening to us. This is happening in our place. This is happening in our lives. And we lean forward, and that is the power of the parable, to draw us into the story ourselves. It's, uh, we can't get fully away from it, and uh, I think the uh, unsettling part of the stories is that there's often a tragic consequence to the choices we make, and the realization that we have the free will to make the most disastrous choices that ruin lives, including ours. And after that, and it, the, I think this is the point the story turns, after that, it doesn't matter what remorse we have, how we beat our chests and say, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. What matters, and always matters to God, what happens next? What happens next when we start the next story, the story we tell with the next part of our lives? What we've done is in some ways unforgivable by ourselves. But God says, well, tell me the next story. Tell me the next part of your life and how it will go and turn out. When we look at this story, and I think one of the most powerful stories that Jesus told was the parable, what we call the prodigal son or the prodigal father. It's the point of the story, and it's uh, near the end, but it's not at the end. When we're told the son is feeding pigs in a land far away, and he came to himself. It's the coup de grace, the realization that turning and repentance is the only way from the tragic moment. And as we turn, we start for home, and we have no way of imagining the welcome that awaits us. The truth of God traps us in our own stories, and the truth of God sets us free. Thanks be to God. Amen. I invite you to join with me in prayer, and uh, <clears throat> as we have talked about before, we have an active prayer chain within the church, and there are a list of names on the prayer chain um, that people are being held in prayer. We hold uh, especially precious those within our congregation that we know, but we also hold in prayer people that uh, others are not aware of, and the suffering that's going on in the lives of all of us, the trials and tribulation, and I think the best uh, way of living in a prayerful way is to realize that everyone you meet is, uh, is struggling with something. Everyone you meet has a story that you may not know, but needs your grace and love and prayers too. It's uh, when we realize as church what we are, are most and first about are people struggling to restore relationships, not to uh, uh, live in fear of sin, but to talk about ways of restoring our relationship with each other and God. That is paramount in God's practice. It's not punishment. It's restoration. And so when we pray, and we, uh, people certainly uh, suffer and die even as we pray, what we're praying for most isn't uh, a future of our creation, but a future of God's creation and grace. So all the prayers we offer, help us offer them in the name of Christ, the one who walks with us and through us and brings us to new revelation and practice 
in the name of God. Amen. And today we're going to sing the Lord's Prayer, and uh, we're going to use two 959 in Voices United. We continue to invite and acknowledge uh, the way people are uh, offering themselves through and to the church and the treasures we have and the treasures we bring. It's uh, interesting, I'm talking about the uh, stained glass windows and uh, you likely can't see many of them uh, on this camera, although you may be able to. I'm not sure um, the direction, uh, um, how much uh, is picked up on the sides, but I was thinking that uh, as we are given stewardship over a place like this and a practice and a tradition like this, um, your pews are waiting and uh, they have been uh, cleaned and polished and they are waiting our arrival as congregation and we continue to hold the fort and uh, um, to continue to uh, keep the light on in the window for all of us that one day we'll return to the sanctuary and we can do so because of your offerings and your givings your love, and your practice of faith. Amen. Our final hymn is 274, Your Hand, O God, Has Guided.
singing. We go from this place into the summertime. May the grace of Christ go with us, the love of God surround us, and the Holy Spirit continue to help us call to account and live honest lives with each other and with God. Our benediction is 586, we shall go out with hope of resurrection.